It was back in Luke 18, verses 31 to 33. Approximately a week before the events that we are going to consider this morning. That Jesus had spoken very clearly to his 12 disciples and said to them that we are heading to Jerusalem. He went on to say that it is there in Jerusalem that he will be delivered over to Gentiles. He will be shamefully mistreated. He'll be mocked, spit upon, flogged, killed. But on the third day, he will rise again. The very next verse tells us in verse 34 that the disciples didn't understand these things. But this is the third time that Jesus had made it very clear that this is why he is here. This is why he is going to Jerusalem. The passage that we are going to consider this morning is a lengthy one. It is Luke 22, verses 63 to 23 and verse 25. And what we have going on in this passage is the Saviour on trial. Jesus is standing before two different courts. The first court he stands before is a religious court. And the second is a civil court. He has been charged of a crime. And he is going to be assessed. He is going to be examined. He will be interrogated. But I want you to understand that as Jesus is on trial here, he is not only receiving those things in a courtroom, but you need to recognize that what Jesus predicted over a week before happens exactly the way he said. He is handed over to Gentiles. Jesus is shamefully mistreated. He's mocked. People spit on him. His beard is plucked out. He is laughed at. He has been abandoned by his disciples and he stands there all alone. What we have presented to us this morning in this passage is the suffering servant. Remember, we are talking about Jesus. John 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Revelation 19 tells us that when he returns, the great declaration will be that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Jesus is the great I am. Jesus declared with his own lips, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the light of the world. He is the good shepherd. He is the bread of life. He is the true vine. This majestic, glorious, sovereign, sinless saviour, is being mistreated. He is being judged by humans. He is on trial. One of the questions we need to naturally ask at this point is that knowing who Jesus actually is, why would Jesus undergo such horrific treatment? Well, I want to answer that question this morning as we consider this passage together. And that answer will come out very clearly at the end of this passage. So track with me this morning. But let me just quickly walk you through the four great realities of this trial. Four significant things are happening as Jesus stands in these two courtrooms. First of all, in chapter 22, verses 66 to 71, Jesus is in complete control of the situation. It's very important to see that. He is in control despite the conniving conspiracy going on in the background. 
Secondly, in 23 verses 1 to 5, Jesus is innocent of all charges. He is not guilty. Thirdly, in verses 6 down to 12, Jesus does not give any answers back to Herod as he is interrogated. Jesus closes his mouth. He is silent. And finally, in verses 13 to 25, Jesus is standing in the place of guilty sinners as he is undergoing this horrible mistreatment. I want to put those four thoughts together under these following headings. We are going to talk about the Saviour's sovereignty, the Saviour's sinlessness, the Saviour's silence, and finally, the Saviour's substitution. So let's begin with the first great reality of our Saviour's trial, and that is his sovereignty. What we have in verses 66 to 71 is the second part of Jesus' first trial. His first trial was he was arrested and he was brought before the Jewish religious leaders. Now, legally, they could only try him at sunrise, daybreak. And that's what Luke records for us. Luke here is recording for us the formal part of his religious trial. But if you have a look at the other gospel accounts, you find out that before the sunrise, Jesus was brought before the religious leaders illegally. And while they were getting all their stories together to condemn him formally, Jesus is on trial in the early hours of the morning. Uh, This is happening while Peter is outside denying Jesus. Jesus is inside being tried by the high priest. And there they asked him straightforward questions. Are you the son of God? And Jesus had engaged with them on these questions. Well, after that trial, which Luke doesn't mention... Jesus is then sent outside, and it was then when he was outside that he gave that look to Peter. He had seen that Peter had denied him three times, and he looked right at him. And after this, we're told in verses 63 to 65 that the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They blindfolded him and kept asking, prophesy, who is it that struck you? This is horrible. Jesus, the Son of God, has been blindfolded and people are punching him and they're mocking the fact that you think you're a prophet. Well, tell us, who hit you then? Who hit you now? Come on, prophet, tell us. But we need to understand that as horrible as this is, this is a fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. This now brings us to the Saviour's sovereignty, and that's in verses 66 to 71. Now that sunrise has come, the rulers of Israel, which was a group called the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin had 71 members, and the chief of this Sanhedrin was the high priest. This ruling body, it is like the supreme court of the Um, nation of Israel at this time, had gathered together and they called Jesus in to be interrogated. Previously, they had brought together some false witnesses. Now Jesus stands before the religious elite, these individuals who are supposed to uphold justice, who are to proclaim and, and apply the law of God to the land. Have Jesus standing before them. And as Jesus stands there, they ask him the question in verse 67, If you are the Christ, tell us. They understood that the scriptures taught that there was a Messiah that was promised. The Messiah or the Christ is the anointed one. This is the coming prophet, priest and king. This is the deliverer of the people of Israel. This is the one who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. And here the religious leaders say, if you are him, we want you to declare with your own words that this is who you are. And the reason for their question is they want Jesus to incriminate himself. 
They want Jesus to say it, and there they'll say, there we have a confession. The man is guilty. He has committed blasphemy. And as the question is asked, notice the answer that Jesus gives. If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. Jesus knows what's going on here. He has already answered these questions in the informal trial that was illegal. And now in the formal trial, they ask him the same question just so they can get him. And Jesus says, why am I going to debate this with you? Now, if these men were sincere, they would have brought the evidence up. They would have said, you are said to be the Messiah and we have noticed that you have performed these great works and wonders that attest to your name. You turned water into wine. You restored sight to the blind. You led those who are in captivity free. You raised the dead. And with your words, you spoke the words of eternal life. But they weren't interested in the evidence. They wanted to condemn him. And Jesus was not interested in debate. But look at what Jesus goes on to say most clearly in verses 69 to 70. He says to them, I'm not, not going to debate you. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Now that is a powerful statement. In that brief statement, what Jesus is declaring is this. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, which brings to mind the imagery of Daniel 7. The Son of Man in Daniel 7 is the one who approaches the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father. And the Son of Man is given power to judge, to rule, and set before him a thrones, and all mankind are brought before him, and the Son of Man judges them on that final day. Jesus said that you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power of God. The reference to the right hand of the power of God is to Psalm 110. And in Psalm 110, we have Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. And the enemies of him will one day be brought to his feet and he will rule over them. What is the major lesson going on here? Jesus would have this Jewish court know this. That even though you think you're in control of this situation, though you have formed a conspiracy against me, though you are trying to condemn me, you need to know that I am the glorious Son of Man and I will come back one day in blazing glory and I will judge the living and the dead. That's what Jesus declared. The reference to the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power of God is the image of a sovereign one. It is the picture of the one in full control of all things. The one who is most bright, most beautiful, and most glorious. This is Jesus. Well, they understood the implications of Jesus referring to himself as the Son of Man. To be seated at the right hand of God. They understood that this is a divine right. This is describing one who is God. And for this reason, they went ahead and asked the question in verse 70, Are you the Son of God then? Is this who you are? Is this what you're claiming? And Jesus responds by saying, You say that I am. Now that is a very interesting phrase, You say that I am. This is an actual affirmation. Jesus is agreeing with them, but he's doing it in somewhat of a way in which he is revealing not a hesitancy, but he is stepping back from the fullness of the statement. They have seen all the evidence. So in a softer way, Jesus affirms the reality that he is who he says he is. Well, it was clear in the minds of the religious leaders. They concluded in verse 71, what further testimony do we, do we need? We have heard it from our own lips. They have him, they feel. Jesus has committed a crime. 
And the crime that Jesus of Nazareth is guilty of is that Jesus claims to be God. Blasphemer. Guilty. Now, it's interesting that according to the Jewish law, that one who committed blasphemy was to be stoned. Now, these individuals are seemingly very committed to the word of God as far as it's convenient. Because at this point, they now want to hand him over to the Roman authorities to be condemned. So they're going to only try to apply half of the Jewish law. But we need to understand that even in their unwillingness to fully apply the word of God, Jesus is sovereign in this situation. He is in control because the scriptures tell us that cursed is the one who dies on a tree. The Jewish law demanded that a blasphemer be stoned to death, but Roman law would crucify somebody on a wooden cross. So in all of this, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. So the first thing I want you to notice from this passage is that Jesus is undergoing this horrendous mistreatment, shameful mockery and trial. But I want you to notice that as Jesus undergoes this horrible experience, he stands there as the sovereign saviour. This now brings us to our next point, and that is our saviour's sinlessness. Now that the religious leaders have made their conclusion... They say that we need to take Jesus to our governor, and that was the Roman leader, Pilate. Now, Pilate held this particular post for 10 years. He wasn't a very popular man among the Jewish people. The Jewish people didn't hold him in high esteem at all. But Pilate was the man responsible to oversee any of the unrests going on in this particular region. So as Jesus is brought before Pilate, the religious leaders begin to accuse him even further, but notice what charge they bring against him. They concluded in the previous passage that Jesus is guilty of blasphemy. Jesus is saying that he is God and therefore he's guilty. But now they bring him before Pontius Pilate and what do they charge Jesus with? Notice verse 2 of chapter 23. We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate, we are really concerned. This man is pulling us away from being loyal to Rome. Do you think they really were concerned about that? Of course they weren't. That is a lie. Jesus himself had said earlier on when they were trying to trick Jesus and when they said to him, see this money, do you you pay the tax or not? And Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to God what belongs to God. Jesus wasn't calling for his people to rebel against the state. He wasn't calling for his people to overthrow the Romans. He was actually calling for them to show the rightful submission. And here they're making an accusation that Jesus is trying to overthrow Caesar. Now, that's a very serious charge in the eyes of Pilate. Because Pilate is supposed to make sure that those type of things don't go on because those things were happening. There were many individuals who were um, Jewish zealots, nationalists, who were trying to overthrow the Roman powers. And a few of them... Uh, actually in this scene. One of them is mentioned by name and possibly the other two are going to be crucified next to Jesus on the cross. So this was not an uncommon thing. So the charge is brought to Pilate that Jesus is guilty. He is guilty of misleading the nation. He is guilty of forbidding people to pay their taxes and he is guilty of claiming to be the king. Now as soon as Pilate hears King, he's very interested. Now Luke gives us a very abbreviated account because he only gives us five verses here. But if you go over to John chapter 18, Jesus is interviewed by Pilate at great length. And Pilate was very concerned about this notion of Jesus wanting to be a king. Pilate's the king, not you. But Jesus had made it very clear to Pilate that my kingdom is not of this world. Once Pilate heard that, 
He was all good with that news. You can be a king anywhere in this universe. As long as it's not here on earth, I'm all good with this. He looked at this man and didn't see him as a threat. There was no army. There was no one there outside for him. His little following of dispatch, they're gone. So this man, this man is not a threat. Now, as this charge is brought against him, Pilate then asks him the question, are you the king of the Jews? Very curious question. To which Jesus answered, you have said so. Now, Pilate went back and forward with Jesus. He asked him many questions. He observed him carefully. He had heard about Jesus of Nazareth. And in the end, Pilate does what the religious leaders didn't. Pilate evaluates all the evidence, considers the charges, listens to the testimony of Jesus, and in the end, Pilate declares, I find no guilt in this man. He says the same thing in verse 14 and verse 22. Three times Pilate recognizes this man is innocent. Here is a man who has considered all the available evidence. He has seen what has happened and his conclusion is that Jesus is innocent. Why is this significant? Well, the significance of this passage is not Pilate's opinion of Jesus. Pilate didn't realize the full significance of that statement because that statement was true but beyond what Pilate could even imagine. Pilate was only speaking with regards to the charges, but we need to understand that Jesus was actually sinless. As Jesus stood there on trial, Jesus is being mocked, he is being spat upon, he is undergoing horrendous punishment and ridicule, but he is standing there as the sinless son of God. That is the evaluation of scripture. Jesus is without sin. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, God made him who knew no sin. Jesus is without sin. Jesus stands on trial as one who is innocent. The holy, pure Son of God is being judged, yet he's sinless. Let's continue to build this and bring it all together. Well, after Pilate had made this clear-cut statement, the crowds were becoming urgent. They were becoming forceful. And in this, they, they said, he stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, even to this place. He is a troublemaker. But as soon as Pilate heard the word, what did you say, Galilee? That was very convenient because he said, if he's from Galilee, then you know what? My hands are clear. I, I oversee Judea. And there is Herod who oversees Galilee, and he's in town right now. Send him off to Herod. Okay, I am clean of this. I don't want anything to do with him. And this brings us now to the third feature of Jesus' trial, and that is the Saviour's silence. Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, as Herod had the jurisdiction over the region in which they had referenced. Now, we need to understand who Herod was. This is one of the sons of Herod the Great. This is Herod Antipas. This is the same Herod that John the Baptist did not hold back from when he, when he heard about the sexual immoral conduct of Herod. Now, this particular Herod was a very capable politician, a very powerful individual, a man who had brought lots of infrastructure into the land of Israel, a very competent man. But this man was sexually immoral. And John the Baptist did not hold back and he called it out. He said, it is sin that this man is entering into sexual immorality. He is despising the beauty of marriage as ordained by God. John the Baptist called it out as a prophet. Now, this news didn't sit very well in the Herod household. We are told that a request was put forward to Herod to serve up the head of John the Baptist on a platter to which Herod agreed to. John was beheaded as a result of Herod's rage. This was a murderous man, an immoral man. This man now 
is going to stand in judgment of Jesus. Jesus is brought before Herod. And as Jesus is brought before him, we're greatly surprised to read verse 8 because we're told that when Herod sees Jesus, he was very, very glad to see him. Why was he glad? Was he glad because he knew that he was a murderous man and that he had committed sexual immorality and he needed the sinless saviour to forgive him? No. Herod was glad that Jesus was there because he said, I've heard about this man. He performs miracles. I want to see some. Show me. Give me a special sign. Do one of your little tricks. He begins to ask Jesus question after question, interrogating him. This man was very curious, but he had no conscience. The sinless son of God has been charged of blasphemy. He has been brought before King Herod, and Herod just wants a little show. What does Jesus say to Herod after Herod tries so hard to interrogate him and ask him questions? Notice the text tells us in verse 9 that after a lengthy interview, Jesus made no answer. He said nothing. Why did Jesus say nothing? He is giving this hardened individual who has seen so much, heard so much, who was confronted with the truth by the greatest prophet and has still acted in open defiance. Jesus, in the end, gives Herod the answer he deserves. It was the silence of judgment. But this fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 53 and verse 7 where we read that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Herod Herod tried hard, but got nothing out of him. And during this time, the religious leaders were there. They were listening, they were watching, and they were becoming furious. We are told that they began to accuse Jesus more and more in verse 10. So in the end, Herod and his soldiers began to treat Jesus with contempt. They mocked him. In the end, they put gorgeous clothing, a robe on Jesus, and they had him standing there mocking him as a king. In the end, this was just a game for Herod. This man claims to be a king, king of Israel. He claims to be the Messiah, the Christ. But you know what? He said nothing. I heard the stories. Let's dress him up as a little king and make fun of him. And that's how they treated the eternal son of God. Well, after this, Herod decided to send him back to Pilate. But it's interesting that in this particular episode, Pilate and Herod, who hadn't previously got along, became good friends. And it's interesting that this is a principle that we see um, carried out throughout life, and that is when individuals who don't love Christ find a, a common cause in mocking and despising Christianity can very quickly form some alliances and friendships. It happens very often, it happens today, and it happened in this passage. This now brings us to our final point. We've seen the Saviour's sovereignty as he stood before the Jewish religious leaders and said that he is the glorious Son of Man who will be seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is in control of the situation. We saw the Saviour's sinlessness as he stood before Pilate and Pilate could see with his very own eyes that this man was innocent. We saw his silence as he refused to play the game of a sceptical and mocking man. We now come to the fourth reality of the trial of Jesus, and that is the Saviour's substitution. That is found in verses 13 to 25. Jesus is now brought back to Pilate. And as Jesus stands there, Pilate called together all the chief priests, the rulers, and the people. And he said to them in verse 14, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people, but after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of the charges brought against him, nor did Herod. People, 
The man is innocent. He's innocent of everything that you have said. He certainly doesn't deserve death. But what I'll do is this. I'll punish him. We'll beat him up a bit. We'll make him draw blood. But then we'll release him. Now, this, of course, is very illogical. Because if Jesus was innocent, why would you even punish him to begin with? You see, Pilate knows that he has a bit of a problem in front of him because he has a large crowd putting on the pressure saying, you have to punish this man. Pilate's thinking, listen, there's nothing wrong with this man. He's certainly not worthy of death. So to make you happy, why don't we just punish him and then we'll release him, all right? Let's, let's do this. But we are told in verse 18 that the crowd begins to come in full force and they are crying out, away with this man. Away with him and release Barabbas. Barabbas? Now who is Barabbas? Luke tells us in the very next verse. Barabbas is a man that had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. This man was was trying to overthrow the Roman government. He got arrested and he's now here to be judged, probably to be sentenced to a crucifixion and maybe the other guys in with him are the ones who are going to be going on the cross as well. Interestingly enough, the name Barabbas means son of the father. They yell out away with him and release the son of the father. Now, we'll look at the significance of that in just a moment. As they give this cry, they continue the chant in verse 21, and here it escalates to its height. Crucify him, crucify him. They want Jesus murdered. They want him put to death. They want him killed. Pilate looks at the crowd, he is perplexed, he says to them the third time, why, what evil has he done? I found no guilt in him deserving of death. I will therefore punish and release him. I am putting my foot down on this, guys. He will be punished, but he will be released. He's innocent. And as he does this, the crowd with great urgency are pressing in on Pilate and they are now demanding with their loud voices that Jesus should be crucified. And you just picture it. The scene is now getting intense. It is so loud that the voices are prevailing over Pilate. He's lost complete control and authority over everybody. And in the end, those voices just prevail. The people are going to get what they want. Now, during this whole encounter, Pilate goes inside, goes outside. Even Pilate's wife says, You can't do this. I had a dream last night that this is not who we think he is. And in a very superstitious culture, that was significant. Pilate is he's confused. He he doesn't know what to do. He knows what to do. He's going back and forward. He, He thinks he's being firm. But in the end, the power of people, the pull of the people was so hard that in the end, he relented. He became a coward and Pilate, in verse 24, decided that their demand should be granted. I will hand him over to be crucified. Jesus is then flogged and in the experience of this flogging, Jesus' flesh is torn open and he is sentenced to death. He is to carry a cross where he must die. But I told you that this last point is the Saviour's substitution. Look at what we read in verse 25. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Let me ask you a question. Who deserved to be punished that day? It was Barabbas. It was Barabbas. It was a murderer. Who was innocent that day? It was Jesus. But I want you to notice something. The crowd said, give us the son of the father. Give us Barabbas. They wanted the guilty son of an earthly father. And the guilty son of an earthly father went free 
while the sinless son of the heavenly father was declared guilty and judged. What's going on in the trial? What's going on in the trial is this. Jesus stood there as sovereign in complete control of this entire situation, fulfilling prophecy. He is there because he knows he must go to the cross. Jesus stands there on trial as sinless, innocent of all charges, silent, not defending himself. But he stands there as a substitute. Isaiah 53 verses 4 and following read as follows. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I asked a question at the start of this message. Why did Jesus, the sinless, sovereign Son of God, willingly undergo the trial? He did that so that he would be sentenced to the cross so that he could take your place. Jesus was on trial so he could be your substitute. The bigger meaning here is this. You and I are like Barabbas, we're guilty. We deserve to be condemned. We should be on that trial. We should be judged. Jesus shouldn't be. But he willingly came to take our place so that all who put their faith and trust in him will be set free, though you are guilty. 2 Corinthians 5.21, I quoted the start of it. Let me finish. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus underwent this horrible trial so that you and I can be freed of the judgment of God because Jesus is going to the cross and what's going to happen at the cross is God the Father is going to unleash his fury and judgment on Jesus and that judgment is going to be unleashed on Jesus because Jesus is carrying your and my sin. Every wicked thought, every sinful act is heaped on Jesus and he is going to take the punishment of God on your behalf. He is going to suffer and die for every evil deed that you and I have done and ever will do. He is going to stand there in our place. He endured the mockery. He endured all the spitting and the shame. He did all of that for you. He did it for you and for me. He could have been released at any moment. He could have gone immediately to heaven, but he came to save you. That is the greatest sacrifice that could ever be made. And that is why Jesus stood there on trial, willingly underwent all of this so that you and me could be set free. And what do we have to do? We have to recognize our sin and our guilt and come with empty hands and cling to Jesus because only he can save us. This is why Jesus suffered. This is why Jesus underwent the trial. It was so that he could go to the cross and be crucified for you and me. Jesus said to his disciples a week before this, we're going to Jerusalem. It's there. I'm going to be handed over to Gentiles. I'm going to be shamefully mistreated, mocked, flogged, killed, but I'll rise again on the third day. He did that for us. Put your rest and trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, what love is this? There is no other picture that can even come close to the greatest sacrifice ever made to bring us life. We are told in your word, but you demonstrate your love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you for our Lord Jesus. Thank you for your great love. How deep is your love? 
Oh God, thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.